welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to the second live episode of Surviving the Survivor for today, the podcast that promises... And not only promises, but we deliver on our promise to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. It is not just a tagline. Uh, We're going to talk today, of course, about all the happenings in court. After nine plus years, Charlie Adelson finally had his comeuppance, his day of reckoning, as he appeared in a Tallahassee courtroom Uh, He was sentenced in the conspiracy and murder of his ex-brother-in-law, FSU law professor, Dan Markell. Some people never thought this day would come. It arrived. Uh, Victim impact statements uh, were read and sent in to Judge Everett. And we're going to hear some of that from Phil Markell, the father of Dan Markell. And of course, now that Charlie is headed to state prison, the question must be asked, what's next for him and what's next for for all the Adelsons, and we've got some best, best guests here to discuss this all. Uh, Some familiar faces. Uh, Bottom left corner is Stephen Webster. Love that. uh, I think it's a photograph of a cow or a bull behind him. Uh, Stephen Webster and Louis Baptiste in the other bottom corner are lawyers behind Webster and Baptiste, attorneys at law in Tallahassee. Stephen Webster was Dan Markell's post-divorce attorney and Louis Baptiste was a student of Dan Markell. Both these guys are remarkable, and so is Tommy Scoville. Uh, He was raised in an upper-middle-class family. Does that sound familiar, like Charlie Adelson? He actually was a professional skier. He became a public speaker. He got very wealthy. Doctors told him no more pain meds after his injuries, and that led him down a deep, dark path where he eventually was convicted for bank robbery. Guy's a handsome, charming guy, so it's no surprise he married his defense attorney, uh, went back to the gym, he got clean, and he started the lifeboat to help people with sobriety. So uh, I'm excited. These are, uh, as I said, three amazing guests. We uh, covered the sentencing uh, this morning. We had people from literally all over the world, the Philippines, Belgium, Kenya, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Vietnam, Dubai, Mariah, all these people, and of course, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Dan Markell's hometown, they were all in the chat this morning. So uh, the internet is truly an amazing thing. Um, Lewis, let's start with you. So, um, you know, I don't know if you, you know, you're a busy attorney, but I don't know if you saw uh, or heard Phil Markell, we're going to play some some pieces of this, but um, if you did see it, just curious what your thoughts are. And if you didn't, just the general fact that uh, justice was finally meted out today. No, I did see his, I did hear and see his comments. And for me, I just took away, it was him letting in, he was, it was Phil letting the world into their lives. It was especially moving to me when he said that he wakes up in the middle of the night some night sweating thinking about his son's murder and everything since the murder. And it, 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 what it really, what the biggest part of that that sticks with me is it's one thing for the murder to be devastating, which of course we know that it had to be for Phil, um, for the entire, for Ruth, for the entire, for Shelly, for the entire family. But the idea that, you know, day after day, month, year, years, almost a decade, that the people responsible for the murder are still out there, that there's your son. And so imagine living and waking up in the morning, knowing that the people who are responsible for the an orchestrated your son's murder are still having luxury breakfast and, and luxury dinner and going on trips and living their best lives. Um, while at the same time, having to wake up middle of the night, sweating, unable to sleep, because you know that your son's killers are out there. And so to me, I thought it was so moving. Um, it show, it, and what it showed is that he there is no getting over it. There's no getting over what he went through. It, it, it never stops. There's no, you know, you go, to a, what you, you go to a movie, sit there for an hour and a half, and then when you leave, the movie's over. For the Markels, the, movies are never, the movie never ends. It's, a, it's an ongoing saga. And so it, his statement was very moving. 
and uh, that's really well put. And uh, if you if you listen to anyone who has suffered loss, and uh, I talk to Ruth often, and I love she's got a, a phrase that she's kind of coined: "Don't get lost in the loss." Um, but there is no such thing as close as closure for any of these people. Um, there's someone here talking about a possible appeal. We'll get to that on the other end of the show, but I want to focus on um, the Markells to start with here. Uh, Busby, back for another STS Nation Live. Good evening, everyone, as people are uh, settling into this chat. Tommy Scoville, um, Jersey in the house, my home state. Hello, Flemington, New Jersey. The Flemington Coat Factory, famous in Flemington, New Jersey. Tommy Scoville, um, you know, you, you turned your life around. Uh, some people... The Charlie Adelsons of the world, um, they can try to rehabilitate, but they're never getting out the way you did. Um, I know you were uh, behind bars with some some high profile inmates, but the murderers who you met, did they seem to show remorse? Uh, we, saw, we saw none of that from Charlie, and we'll get to that. Um, but we saw none of that today. In general, uh, though, do you, do you hear remorse or feel remorse from these killers behind bars? You, you know, they come in a couple of varieties. Uh, what I have found is that you have people who snap and they do things that honestly, as, as rotten as it is, it kind of makes sense to you. You know, somebody comes home and catches their wife with another guy. And, you know, those kind of things, uh, you find people that very often show remorse. And then there's a different kind of killer, like the Drew Petersons and the, you know, the people that I ran into that are just downright evil. And, you know, this one here is just... I mean, the reason that every country in the world is fascinated is because it's just rotten, isn't it? I mean, even from, you know, from any level, this is a family that, that just seems like every single part of this family was involved in this. It's just uh, it's so ugly. But yeah, you don't see a lot of remorse from uh, from the people that that seem to have gotten very involved. It's the snap, the snap people that screwed up and killed somebody, you know, lost it and snapped. But the people that plan stuff out, I mean, that takes a kind of uh, a kind of evil that you know, you don't run into, believe it or not, very often in prison. But when you do, they stick out. You remember those people. Wow. I think uh, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, great insight. We're going to get into where Charlie's heading next. I'm just going to have you mute, Tommy. So there's a little bit of a uh, hiccup. It's all okay. good. We'll just have you mute when you're not talking. And uh, Stephen Webster, to you. Um, look at this comment here from Jonathan Judd. They say life is stranger than fiction. When are When's Hollywood going to make uh, a movie of this case? They probably will. But. Stephen Webster, uh, what did you make of today? It was nine plus years in the making. You know, you talked to us and so did Lewis, of course, about all the way back getting the news of Dan's murder. You were his post-divorce attorney. But what did today mean to you? Well, you know, <clears throat> I guess out of every tragedy, there can be some positives. You know, I, I believe some of the positives that have come from this uh, would be the way that societies all across the world, as your show has proven, have kind of united behind the Markels, you know, and um, supported the Markels. And, um, you know, one of the other positives for me was I had an opportunity to meet Ruth and Phil. I probably, you know, I may not have ever had that opportunity just representing Dan. <clears throat> and uh, it was nice to hear Phil speak today, hear his voice uh, speaking for the family. Um, you know, Ruth has been tireless in her advocacy for Dan and for justice. Um, and it, you know, it, it was nice to hear Phil, Phil speaking. Um, but I was just struck by the senselessness, honestly, of everything and just the loss, you know, all the way across the board. You know, I mean, sure, we all want the people that did this to be held accountable, but it's just so senseless and such a waste, you know. And Charlie Adelson's life, you know, was thrown away. He's, he's got a child out there, you know, that's not going to have his dad there. And, um, you know, there's just nothing, honestly, to feel good about for me from any of it today. It just kind of, it just reinforced just how senseless and tragic the whole thing was. Uh, Lewis, you talked really eloquently, you know, Dan was your professor. Um, and you, you, you've told us uh, his love for his kids. Today is a day where we should be remembering Dan. Um, just tell us a little bit about his relationship with his boys, because today Phil spoke about his own boy, uh, who was Dan, and that really touched my heart watching him literally, uh, you know, being born into this world. But what was Dan's relationship with Ben and Lincoln? Um, I knew them as uh, 
and I didn't know them personally, but in class he called him Lincoln and Ben Ben. You know, that's I, I I didn't know his name was that Ben Ben's real name was Benjamin until probably 2020 or 2021. I think was when I when I, when I actually figured out that his real name was Benjamin. Could have guessed, but he never referred to him as that. His affectionate name for him was Ben Ben. And this is a this is a criminal law class one now criminal law class where we're learning we're talking about hardcore subjects, murder, uh, manslaughter, you know, sexual assault, uh, sexual battery, and so the mens rea and actus reus for those individual crimes. That's what we're talking about. And still, in this class of hard subjects, tough subjects, um, Markel still found a way to interweave and incorporate his sons. He would still, almost every class, multiple times a week, find a way to talk about Lincoln and Ben Ben. Um, I heard Lincoln and Ben Ben so much that I've never, I've never met Benjamin. Pray I get to meet him one day to tell him how awesome of a guy his father was. But the name Ben Ben stands out in my head. Nine, I took Markel's class in 2014, so nine years later, because of how often he mentioned his children. And so that tells you um, what kind of person he was. That tells you that, again, I, I keep saying it, and I won't stop that. Um, there is no doubt to me that his two boys meant more to him than any accolade, than any degree. Um, but Phil Markell talked today about how when Dan was 13 years old, he decided he wanted to go to Harvard and that he went on to go to Harvard and graduated magnum cum laude and all in, and worked at amazing firms across the country. I have no doubt that the Harvard degree didn't mean anything to Professor Markell in comparison to his boys. That the, the tenure track at FSU didn't mean anything to Professor Markell compared to his boys. You know, this and so hearing hearing Phil Markell talk about um his boy, you know, he, hearing Phil Markell talk about Dan as a boy, about how adventurous he was, how studious he was, how he was always into academics, how funny he was, how he loved to cook. Hearing Phil Markell talk about that just makes me, it, it was frustrating because Professor Markell never got to make those memories. He never got to see Lincoln and Ben make promises to go to Harvard and then do it. He never got to see them, you know, learn to love to cook. He never got to learn to, he never got to see them play for uh, Pee Wee football or Little League soccer. He never got to see that. And so hearing Phil Markell talk about the memories of watching Dan grow up just made it more real that that's what was stolen. That's what was stolen from Dan, the opportunity to make those memories with his boys. And I thought it's what Webster said. Webster said this on your show last week, Joel. He said that he thinks those boys are probably brainwashed is what Webster said. And I thought it was moving today because Phil used those exact words today in the sentencing. He said that, you know, for the first seven years, we had zero contact. I, I can't imagine how torturing that must be for seven years to not even see them, not once for seven years. And that in the past two years, they've had, and I think he said extremely supervised, um, which means that you could, that, you know, it's almost like it, it almost, of course, I didn't talk to him about it, but it seemed as if he was policed in what he could say or what he could do as far as his spending time with those kids. And he used the same word Webster used last week when he said, I think they've been brainwashed. And so not, not only did Markel lose them, and it, the whole family lost these boys. Um, and now we, I call them boys because in my head, that's where they were. That's what they were when I saw their drawings on Professor Markel's door. But we have to remember, you know, these aren't little boys anymore. You know what I mean? These are these are guys who are going to be teenagers. And so that's hard to comprehend. Yeah. And uh, they are. They're not little like toddlers anymore. They're 13 and 14. They're able. They're very smart, which is not surprising because the apple doesn't fall from uh, far from Dan's tree. Um, by the way, someone who knows them well reached out to me and uh, said to me, listen, when I watch your show, a lot of people say, well, Wendy's smart and Dan is smart. And he said, I, I just want you to know that there is a massive distinction between Wendy's intelligence and Dan's intelligence. It's on a whole different level um, and they should not be compared. Um, 
to each other in terms of their intelligence level that Dan, you know, far uh, outshined Wendy in, in that regard. So uh, it was an interesting conversation I had. Um, Eileen McCarthy says, Phil's victim impact statement. It's a, it's a legacy speech for Ben and Lincoln, Dan's children. That's interesting. I didn't think of it that way. Um, back to you, Tommy Scoville. Uh, you did some bad things. Um, I don't think you ever hurt someone that I'm aware of. Um, and you're gonna have to unmute yourself. But did you were you ever on the receiving end of a victim impact statement, or did you yourself ever speak in court? And if not, what sort of impact do you think these victim impact statements have? Uh, I need to, you need to unmute. I'm sorry, Tommy. Just hang on, Tom. Uh, I gotta unmute you. Go, you you have to do it, Tommy. <laughs> okay, go. are we yummy? Yep, yes, sir. Are you kidding? You're good. Are you, are you hearing us, Tommy? Hey, nothing. I am not muted. I'm not muted. No, you're, you're good. You're good. You're good. All you're right. good. You're good. Let me tell you what. I'm going to bail and come back. That's what I'm going to do. That's what We're going to keep going without Tommy. So uh, yeah, go, go ahead. I, I did. You were just talking about something. That I, I, I just want to take a pause there. After your show last week, I went back and found a clip of, of Professor Markell um, talking about retributive justice that I want to send to you that you can share with your users. Because what we're talking about is intelligence. This was uh, Professor Markell giving a speech to a room full of other lawyers, breaking down a subject in which he was, you know, one of the foremost scholars in the country. And so, uh, you know. It's interesting that you said that. I'm looking for this live on the air here. Um, I'm going to read this to everybody. I got this. Um, I got this text message from someone that knows uh, both Wendy and Dan, and I'd like to get your take on it. This is about retributive justice. Danny actually wrote this, and I'm going to tweet this out at Podcast STS, and I'll put it up um, on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor, but on Twitter at Podcast STS. He wrote this, listen to this, in 2001 in a law review that appeared, uh, Stephen Lewis, in the Vanderbilt Law Review. And I'm just going to bring Tommy back in here. And it's, you have us, Tommy? Tommy? I'm going to have uh, the COE take care. I'm going to have the COE take care of that. Listen to this quote. He writes, Dan Markell, thus, I may feel guilt after successfully murdering my ex-lover, despite the fact that no one suspects me of anything evil. By contrast, I may feel shame when my parents and my friends discover the unseemly fact of my wrongdoing and, for example, denigrate me before the view of others. This is something that he wrote about retributive justice and I'll read it one more time because this is out of the blue 2001. He writes, thus, I may feel guilt after successfully murdering my ex-lover, despite the fact that no one suspects me of anything evil. By contrast, I may feel shame when my parents and my friends discover the unseemly fact of my wrongdoing. And for example, denigrate me before the view of others. Um, that is... Uh, portending the future, Stephen Webster. It's uh, almost eerie to hear, isn't it? It is. You know, it's, um, you know, it, it, <clears throat> your show last week, it really kind of took me back down in uh, the recesses of my memory and kind of all the things that have come and gone over the past almost 10 years. And, uh, you know, I said last week on the show, and I'm, I'm going to say it again, and every time I have an opportunity in case that Ben and Lincoln, if they ever do watch any of these shows where I'm speaking, um, <clears throat> how Dan literally treated every second he had with those children, like they were finite and they were limited and they were precious. That's when I say, like when I would call him, if he was with the boys at the park, I remember he, he said, I'm at the park with the boys. I'll call you back. He was not about to waste one single second no. with his sons at that park. He wasn't going to spoil it talking to me. Right. And it's almost like he could, you know, looking at it now, you know, you almost wonder. Um, thank goodness that he cherished every single second. You know, the seconds I take for granted every day and I shouldn't shame on me. But, you know, 
I'm, I'm grateful to God that he didn't take those seconds for granted now, looking back on it, because they were precious. You know, unbeknownst to all of us, they were more precious than we could ever imagine. And uh, you hit the nail on the head there. But I think, and by the way, I'm just messaging Tommy. A lot of people are like, why are you always looking at your phone? I'm always doing something related to the show if I am looking at my phone. But we are trained broadcasters here, <laughs> and I can multitask. Tommy, are you hearing us now? He is, oh, he is not hearing us. So I'm going to remove him again. I'm going to have the COE try to help him. Um, so you talk about Erie. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like there was a premonition there as well for me. You know what I mean, Joel? I was looking back on it like, you know, did he know in his heart that, you know, how did he know to, to cherish everything? Because I'm telling you, it's more so than anybody I've ever met. I've known a lot of amazing human beings in my life. I've been fortunate. Louis Baptiste is one of the most amazing human beings you'll ever meet. But I've never known anybody, anybody who valued those moments, every moment with his children the way that Dan did. Yeah, and uh, I think we all, what I was saying was we all take that for granted. And uh, already I see my kids growing up pretty quickly. And they say that the days are long, but the years are short. And, uh, you know, he has me thinking. And uh, you don't want this death to be in vain. And maybe that's one of the lessons is you really try to appreciate your family, your friends uh, before it is. Uh, look at this comment right here. Barbara wants to know how late am I? It's never too late. You better start appreciating things, though, quickly, because you never know. You just never know. Um, let's start to listen to parts of this victim impact statement. It was given over Zoom, so it's a little tough to make out. But this is, of course, Phil Markell, Phil Markell and this is uh, Dan's father speaking over Zoom. It's not the greatest connection, but uh, let's, let's listen in. And he's talking here about his grandson's bar mitzvah. Here we go. Went on to the ceremony. The ceremony and party. All without the present or participation. Missing out on this important moment in Ben's life was incredibly painful. After so many years without Danny, we had hoped to make progress in forging a consistent relationship with his son. To this important life cycle event. Dan's murder brought his life abruptly to an end for no sensible reason <clears throat> and has affected a countless number of people. And uh, so there you see it. I mean, he's just trying to make sense of, and I'm just letting the COE here know to try to help out with Tommy. Um, she's trying to help out behind the scenes. But uh, Steve, your reaction to hearing that, talking about the Adelsons, the bar mitzvah, not being invited, not knowing about it, uh, being left out in the dark. You know, it's just devastating. It fills me with rage, quite frankly. You know, sitting there looking at Charlie, um, even Dan Rashbaum, I think his attorney there was you know, troubled. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they tried so hard. The Markels did to, to kind of act like all, what all of this other stuff wasn't happening and just tried to cobble together a relationship, um, you know, with Wendy that would allow them to see their grandchildren, to be there at those most critical moments, once in a lifetime moments of their grandchildren's lives, you know, <clears throat> and they just stole it all from, them, you know, without any any remorse, any concern, any regret. And it really just reveals just how depraved these people are, you know? Um, it's as if you can't make it worse, you know? And they still somehow, somehow find a way to make it worse. They are, you know, that just terrible human beings. And I, I hesitate to even refer to them as human beings. It's just beyond gross. And I'm so, you know, so upset and so sorry for the Markell family. You know, Phil and Ruth are just beautiful people. Shelly Markell, you know, she kind of gets glossed, like, you know, kind of forgotten sometimes here, you know, his sister. Um, an amazing person, you know, amazing people. Like, if you meet them, they are just as sweet and genuine and, you know, kind to do this to them after, you know, killing their son, you know. It's just unbelievable.
And like I said, I didn't think my conscience could be shocked. I mean, I've seen a lot working in this profession. These folks find a way every time. Uh, Steve, uh, just on one note that is rubbing me the wrong way. You know, the title of my show, Surviving the Survivor. My mother's a Holocaust survivor. And, and I don't think you do divorce uh, on a daily basis, but you did handle Dan Markell's post-divorce, um, you know, dealings. And there was this Holocaust diamond. It's a family heirloom, and it still has never been returned. Do you think it ever will be? And what does that say about the depths that the Adelsons go to here, that they won't even return a Holocaust diamond? Yeah, you know, and I, the worst part is I know you know the answer to that question. <laughs> you know, of course they're not. I mean, she wouldn't, she wasn't going to do it back then. She's certainly not going to do it now. Um, she can't even be shamed into it. Um, you know, there's there's literally no level of shame that she seems to, uh, you know, relent to, obviously. I mean, you know, the bar mitzvahs, you know, I'm not Jewish, but got a lot of Jewish friends and I understand the significance of that, you know, and to deny the Markels that opportunity, um, change their last name, um, you know, the, the Holocaust diamond, you know, you, like I said, every time I think they've hit the lowest of lows, they make me reset the spectrum. Um, and my spectrum was all, like I said, was already low. I've, I've, you know, worked as a criminal prosecutor. I've worked in criminal defense. I've, you know, been around the block before I went to law school, lived some life, and I have seen some stuff. You know, this is the second murder trial I was a witness in. You know, I have I've lived a life. I've seen some bad. These people redefined evil for me. And that's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, there must be something in the, in the water up in Tallahassee. I just happened to catch the end of a dateline last night. And I saw Georgia Kappelman and I, I forget his name. I apologize. But he was a potential serial killer or a serial killer sentenced to death. And uh, I, I, key, I, I should know the name, but I don't. Um, he was killing women in, in parks, uh, like national and state parks. Oh, yeah. I, I always want to say Collins. It's not Collins, but. Um, I'll have to, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it out, but, uh, something in the water up in Tallahassee, uh, to you, Lewis from soul Storm, We're trying to get Tommy Scoville back on. I really wanted him on tonight just to show us, uh, give us a perspective from, uh, in terms of what Charlie's life is going to be like now, because it is not going to be a lot of fun. Um, soul star here says Lewis, I'm curious to get your reaction. When do you won't live a minute of peace now? Do you agree with that? And shout out to rock and Dawkins for, Gifting five, gifting uh, five surviving the survivor memberships. Uh, go ahead, Lewis. I do. I, I agree. I don't think she's going to live a moment of peace, not a single moment. I think that what we have to look at is that um, Wendy had a close relationship with her brother. We can see that in that we see that in the phone calls and in the emails that this family unit was extremely close. Um, when I say family unit, we know that there's an estranged there's an estranged brother strange brother that they're not close with but outside of him it seemed like wendy charlie the, the, you know um donna and were extremely close and so now we know that um charlie's going to prison for the rest of his life won't see another moment of freedom and so her brother's gone and she has to live with the fact that her brother's gone and convicted that's going to be real for her every single day she has to know that her mom is behind bars and now she just saw a motion that talked about how bad the conditions are for her mom. And so now you have to live with as a person, just any person, knowing that your mom is in prison, in jail, potentially going to prison forever, and your brother is already in prison forever. And so not only do you have, do you have to live with the pain, the frustration, the anger uh, that comes from those, those two factors being a reality, you also have to live with the fact that it's possible you're going to be in jail and it's possible you're going to be in prison. And so literally you have to wake up every morning knowing that there's a knife hanging above your head that could drop at any moment. At any moment, the feds could knock the FBI um, could, or FDLE could knock on your door and arrest you for a murder or solicitation of a murder. And so as a lawyer, what do you do? How do you wake up? And I think that over the course of nine years, eight years, the Mark, uh, the Adelsons became, they became brazen in the fact that this is not going to touch us. 
you know, we're, they, they really felt like, in my opinion, they were insulated from this crime. They had taken all the reasonable steps to protect themselves. I really think that. Um, and I think that what we saw is Charlie's conviction and his now prison sentence, it pops that bubble. They know that that protection they thought they had is gone. And so in a matter of months, your brother is now convicted and your mom is arrested. And now you have to live with the fact is every day, Wendy wakes up thinking, am I going to get arrested? And every night she goes to sleep thinking it wasn't today, but it could be tomorrow. That's not a life I'd want to live. Horrible life. And uh, you guys all know my stance on prison, biggest deterrent. And I know people that know her here in Miami where I am. And uh, I know she is concerned. Um, she's looking over her shoulder. Uh, please continue to send in the questions. If you do, put a capital QQQ so I can catch it in the chat. Uh, this one is for Stephen from uh, Richard Poplis. And as we go, we're going to go through this victim impact statement that was so powerful from Phil Markell. Eventually, we'll get to Charlie. I'd like to put him a little bit on the back burner. I did have Tommy here who's having connectivity issues because I wanted people to get some insight into what Charlie's bleak life is about to be all about. Uh, he's about to be taken to uh, an intake center uh, in the panhandle, and it's going to go downhill from there. But Richard Poplis here. Steve Webster, did Dan ever think anyone would try and kill him? Did he know about Donna and Wendy's email about dressing the boys in Hitler outfits? Did he know about it? No, I don't believe that, he, that Dan sends to that, Richard. And I don't believe he knew about the, uh, the, the Hitler uh, outfits and the, those emails, uh, thankfully. Um, you know, I, I really believe that as far as, um, you know, Dan's premonitions, you know, or whatever, feelings about the, about the proceedings and the litigation, um, he was concerned that they that Donna would not stop alienating him from his children, that she would continue to persist in that, and disparage him and denigrate him in front of the children and try to drive a wedge between his relationship. Um, and he was definitely worried about that. But I really got the sense from Dan that he felt like a lot of the other stuff was was just kind of background noise and it would all work itself out eventually, you know, after after they kind of went through the, you know, the machinations in the process that eventually people, uh, you know, the stuff would kind of die down and the Fuhrer would die down, you know, with the exception of the alienation. He was genuinely concerned about that. But I don't believe that any, you know, I certainly didn't. And I don't, I don't think he did either believe that um, Charlie would hire a hitman through Katie McBonough and Secreto Garcia and Rivera and they'd come up here and execute him in the driveway. No, I don't believe he sensed that. Uh, you know, I guess no rational thinking person would sense that um you know we got this case in utah where a woman poisoned her husband and it was like the second or third time uh and then she finally got him and he died but uh here i guess there was no prior indication horrific horrific outcome florida politics uh the website's been uh covering this very well they their opening paragraph today about this uh sentencing was interesting. I'm going to read it aloud and uh, I'd love to get your take, Lewis. It says, by all accounts, Charlie Adelson didn't care too much where his sister, Wendy Adelson, lived. He had his own life, a lucrative career as a traveling periodontist with side gigs in real estate, investments, steroid peddling and more, a Ferrari, a limo and a boat, a house with a pool and hot tub on the Fort Lauderdale Intracoastal plenty of girlfriends and plenty of time to enjoy it all. My question to you, Lewis, why, why would he have done this? Oh, you're muted, Lewis. <laughs> I can fix this. one. I was actually talking to my paralegal uh, about that question, that exact question this afternoon. And it's, she asked it. she said, well, why Lewis? And I think is the answer we see it is that um, when we look at it's Donna, it's just a one word answer. The only it's Donna, period. And so explaining that is that, look, when we look at the nature of the relationship between Donna and Charlie, it's not normal. You know, I, I consider myself and Webster will tell you I'm a mama's boy. I'm a mama's boy, mama's boy. You know what I mean? Um, I, I can't say it louder. My wife would come in and I'll get in trouble. But um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a mama's boy. And still, I talk to my mom several times a week. I talk to her 40 minutes today. Um, but. If during the trial, what we saw come out was that, you know, even prior to this murder, 
Charlie was talking to Donna twice a day. You know, that's not extremely normal. You know what I mean? And it's not like Donna was frail and Charlie was acting like her caretaker. That is different. I think that this relationship was extremely close. And I think what happens is we know that Donna became obsessive about where Wendy was living and that Donna wanted the boys within her reach and that Donna was not going to stop until the boys were within her reach. And so what I think is very clear to me is that Donna was the captain of the ship, that she was the driver of the car. And I think that Charlie became, you know, Charlie clearly suffered from suffered and continues to suffer from delusions of grandeur. And that and to Charlie, he's, you know, he's this Ferrari drive. He's this Ferrari driving. He runs La Solis, big time periodontist. And so for him, you know, he thought he was living in Miami Vice. I really think that he just thought he was, you know, he thought he was in Miami during, during the cocaine cowboy days. And I think that, and so when Charlie said it was nothing, well, mom, my mom wants this guy gone. He's screwing with my sister. I'll make it happen. I'm the guy. If I want to get somebody knocked off. I'll get them knocked off. I think that Charlie became infatuated with the experience of it. I, I don't believe, honestly, and I think when you watch the trial, I don't believe that Charlie had so much hate for Markel. I don't believe that Charlie cared so much about Wendy relocating to Miami. I don't believe any of those things. And I agree with Florida politics on that. But I do think that Charlie cared a lot about proving himself in his family, that he was the man and that he could take care of it. And so that's exactly what he did. He tried. He, he took care of it. And I think that's what we see. Um, I know we're going to get here in the show, but I think we see that especially, especially we see that um, when we watch, when I was watching uh, the arraignment in the, in the emotion hearing for Donna, I saw exactly how this happened. I saw the kind of person she was, the way she lied, the way, you know, this is court. You're, you're, in tr- you're on trial for murder and her, and her, and she just, the way she snickered, the way she said, oh, my gosh, like those mannerisms to be in a circuit courtroom where you're on trial for murder and your life is you're the rest of your life is on the line. And that in the fact that you could laugh and smile shows us exactly what kind of person she is. And so and that's the kind of person that organized and orchestrated the murder of Dan Markell. Uh, she had to be told to pipe down by Judge Everett. She was incredulous. By the way, no one can accuse me of being a mama's boy. I kid. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she she was, you know, she was indignant, incredulous. Her face is uh, agape, wide open. People have been posting some funny memes about that. But uh, you do uh, see that controlling nature when you are looking at her. Um, it is my, uh, by the way, uh, Sir Serge. Deb, everyone's making fun of me because I can't read half these names. That Holocaust diamond is gone, and there's no telling what Wendy did with it. Um, June, please tell us, uh, Steve, I'm going to come to you on this in a moment, when you think Wendy will be arrested. But look, I I talked about this on Court TV. Uh, Murder is something that would never enter my mind uh, for any reason at all. However, pushing my mother's buttons, that has uh, entered my mind uh, many times and has been... um, enacted a lot uh, for different di- under different scenarios. My point is it, this is my belief that Wendy was definitely pushing some buttons and getting Donna <laughs> to act and take action. And I'm curious, number one, Steve Webster, if you think that is the case, and if you do think that there's enough here to eventually indict her, charge her and bring her into custody. I'm sorry. So the first part of your question was whether or not I believe Donna was the one pushing. The well, what, well, if Wendy had any any, you know, not from a legal perspective, but if you think that Wendy was manipulating Donna in any way to have Charlie act on this. I believe that Wendy was involved based upon, you know, there are problems in her testimony now, her turning down Trescott, which is what she had originally told Greg Isom she had done and drove all the way up to the crime scene tape which would have been just a couple of doors down from where her sons were staying. And she didn't bother to show, you know, jump out, ask any questions um, to make sure her sons were okay. Um, and then turned around and there's a police officer who testified that he saw a vehicle matching the vehicle, her vehicle description that came up, turned around and left. You know, that was her original testimony. She stuck with it. That's in the can before she ever got a subpoena. 
There's no use in derivative use immunity for that testimony, for that statement she provided to Craig Ice. So she has to own that. OK, <clears throat> so she has to explain why she took this circuitous route all the way over to the ABC liquor store, which is literally right here behind that bowl. And then go down Trescott inexplicably, see the crime scene tape, turn around, you know, and then there's the 18 minute phone call with her brother, you know, right before which obviously, which is, you know, really suspicious given the circumstances, um, <clears throat> especially uh, because it's my understanding that the Best Buy uh, person had kind of indicated, you know, that there was nothing that could really be done for the TV. There's just no rational explanation for why Charlie wouldn't be on, in his Ferrari riding around as opposed to sitting on an 18 minute phone call with his sister about a, bro flat, a broken flat screen TV that wasn't worth you know, probably a hundred dollars. Um, so, you know, I believe she was involved in it. She knew about it. And so that's my personal belief, whether or not, um, you know, she was pushing the buttons. I'm going to, you know, I will kind of echo what Lewis said and what my wife said, my wife watched that arraignment. She said, there's no doubt in my mind who the boss is now. And the same thing, you know, and I agree with Lewis. There is no doubt in my mind after watching that, who the boss was. And I also agree with Lewis that Charlie, I don't think he was doing it for Wendy at all. You know, I, I think he was doing it for Donna, solely for Donna. Um, and, you know, so I think she was the one pushing the buttons. I, I, you know, I think Wendy, you know, they had a weird dynamic between the two of them, um, you know, where it almost seemed like Donna kind of, kind of almost manipulated Wendy a little bit. You know, she, she kind of left her in a position where she kind of felt like she had her own voice, but Donna really was kind of pulling the strings there for Wendy. But, um, you know, as far as Wendy being arrested, you know, I think, uh, you know, personally, I think that there's some real damning evidence against Wendy already that turned down Trescott and her, her prior denials. They just do not make sense. And when you couple that with what Jeff LaCasse said, Wendy said to him, you know, right there before the murders that Charlie had seriously looked into it. That's an admission against her. That is direct evidence that can be used against her to show she had foreknowledge of what we all know is true now. Charlie did hire hitmen to come up here and kill Dan Marquette. That's true. That is established fact at this point. And Jeff LaCasse can implicate her directly with direct evidence in that regard. She's driving past. And then somehow, according to Luis Rivera, they wait an hour or whatever it was before they, as they drove out of Tallahassee, before they call Katie. And when they do, guess what? Katie already knows they really did it. Well, you know, that's a pretty compelling little picture there for me. So, you know, do and I think the arrest is imminent? No. You, you don't think uh Not when do you imminent. think when do you think there could be an arrest? Do you think they have to deal with Donna first? I think so. I think like Lewis said last time, you know, they George has been methodical and and her plan has worked to perfection. It seems like every one of these proceedings, she kind of pulls out a little bit more, like Lewis referred to them as breadcrumbs, you know. And I think Wendy is teetering by a breadcrumb. I don't think she needs that Georgia needs plurals. I think she needs a breadcrumb and before it's probably going to tip the scale for Jack Campbell and Georgia Kaplan. So Wendy better tread lightly. Mm. Uh, she, uh, from what I'm understanding, uh, has a new boyfriend. Uh, no surprise there. Um, moving Only on, with her, moving on with her life, but uh, maybe not for long. Um, Jennifer Lemke, First time here. Love having new people. Hey, Lifeboat Crew, that is Tommy Scoville. Tommy's having some tech issues. The COE is working behind the scenes. Uh, hope you will come back, Jennifer, um, and stay here and uh, become part of STS2. And I'm hoping we can get Tommy up so we can get a uh, slightly different perspective of what's going on with Charlie here. Um, Wendy knew exactly, this has come from Jay, what to say to incense her parents. She said what she had to say to flip the switch to move Dan from the picture. I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. We'll see if this plays out. Let's listen to another clip here. Um, there he is on screen. But let's play this clip. And uh, this has to do with, uh, I can't even understand my notes. So we'll take a listen and uh, watch together. No idea of what these two boys know. Have been they have no idea of Just so you know, to set up, uh, Phil's talking about how these two boys have, he has no idea what these two boys uh, have been through or been up to. Again, the audio is on the uh, pool feed. It is not great, but uh, he's talking about having no idea what's going on with his grandchildren. Here we go. What these two boys know or have been told about Danny's death. They truly believe, I truly believe that 
that they have been brainwashed in all these years, from the ages of three and four years of age to the present day. I also have no idea what the boys know of us, the entire Martell family, our history, etc., and especially <clears throat> how much we all love them and how we wish they were active part of our family. Heartbreaking. Lewis, uh, he's saying he has no idea what the boys even know about them, that they're not a part of the family. He wishes they were. Um, your thoughts on here. And I don't know if you have kids, Lewis, uh, substantially younger than Webster and I in Scoville, but uh, it is, uh, I never yeah. thought I would have them. I had them late in life, but uh, very glad I did. Curious uh, your take on here. It's heartbreaking. I mean, it's, 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 it's heart shattering. Um, here, these boys are 13 and 14 years old. They're, uh, Phil and Ruth Markell's only grandchildren, and they have no idea what their grandchildren know about them. They have no idea what their grandchildren think about them. I can't imagine a worse reality. And and I think what makes it worse than what he talked, what he said earlier too, he said was that their names were changed. And I think that so often that's glossed over, but you know, I think that's so important is because what what Wendy did was she not only wiped Markel off this earth, but by changing her son's names, she attempted to stop the lineage to make so there's no more there's no more Markels that come that come forth in the future, that there won't be another Markel 20 years from now, that Lincoln's sons and Benjamin's sons, that they'll take the Adelson last name instead of the Markel last name like they should. And so it talks about, to me, the wall. That's what she's built. To me, that's what Phil described. Phil was describing a wall that has been built between them and those children. And, and what he said was, we've seen one brick be removed. We got to visit them once. Another brick be removed. We got to visit them twice. But he's talking about a great wall that has been built between the Markels and those two boys. And the problem is, is that what Wendy did is, she, when we say the Markels, that should include Lincoln and Ben Ben. You should never be able to say the Markels and then not include Lincoln and Benjamin. But Wendy changed their names to Adelson to make it so that when you're talking about the Markels, you're not including those two kids, those two boys. And that's what Phil is talking about. And that's uh, that's just that's almost just as criminal as the act itself is what they've done since. It's almost just as criminal. That deserves life in prison just as much as the act deserves life in prison. Mm. Well said. And that's Amy. just as deserving. Amy Love here says it was all for Don. I guarantee that it was not the first time, just the first time someone lost a life. Uh, this comment, looking at Donnie yesterday, we haven't seen nothing yet in trial. It's going to be epic. Come on, Sarah. Come on, Georgia. Your dream cross. Tommy, do you have us? Uh, just unmute yourself now. Yeah, I think we do. Do we have you? Oh, beautiful. Because we have lifeboat yeah. people here, and they were Jones for you, man. I'm going so, to have to give your wife all the credit for that, though. <laughs> I, I certainly did not fix any problems here. She's <laughs> she's good behind the scenes there and in front of the scenes, but she is a tech wizard, as is Space Coast, as are our mods who are uh, holding down the fort in the chat. But, Tommy Scoville, when we lost you, I was asking you if you had ever been on the receiving end of a victim impact statement, and do you think people oh, yeah. who are being put away. Uh, what, so what was it like for you to be on the receiving end? So mine was uh, the, the person did not come to, uh, to court. Uh, it was mailed to uh, the judge in a, uh, in a letter and it was one of the tellers. And uh, you know what, the day I got it, it didn't mean much, but uh, I got sober and, uh, and I started to, uh, to, to, you know, I went and got my college degree and I started moving forward in life. And um, I remember when I was packing up, leaving one joint to go to another and uh, coming across it and, I frightened this woman. Like I scared the hell out of her. And in, and in my head, you know, I didn't use a gun. I didn't threaten anybody. And I went in and said, you know, I used to literally this, I'm not, no one's getting hurt. I just not need the money, but I scared the hell out of this woman. And 
reading the uh, the impact statement um, again, not not the first time I read it, didn't have much of an effect. Uh, I probably called her a few names because when I first got busted, I was you know. But it, I think, I think if you're a human being, you have to be affected by an in, an impact statement. I listened to the one that that we're talking about now, and it was heart wrenching. You know, you, there, you could hear the pride in this man's voice for all that his son had accomplished, and at the exact same time, the the horror of the fact that all of that was stolen for zero apparent reason like this this just should have been a divorce right should just not have been that that big a deal and he you know that that's such an amazing point that you were just making about them canceling the uh, the name that that to me would be worse than anything to, yeah. that's stopping the the lineage is just I, i've never i hadn't ever thought about it i mean I, I knew she had changed the name but that's horrific it really is that's horrific yeah. Hey, Tommy, um, we were talking also, so, you know, Donna was in court yesterday for her arraignment and she was looking incredulous and defiant and all these things. So Steve and uh, Lewis and I were talking about how Donna was probably the mastermind. I'm curious if you think that that is the case, if she was the controlling matriarch, matriarch, but also if you think that Wendy had any um, involvement in terms of egging her mother on. I, I get the, the feeling with this family after watching them that uh, Wendy was uh was the reason that everything in that family happens but i think that everybody's filthy i do and the sad thing is then what you know i mean the, the, these poor children you know that they're this is what this is what they're understanding and they're at an age that i mean i don't know you know they they don't have cell phones <laughs> like this is really a, the, the whole world knows about what's going on in this i'd be really hard pressed to, to think that they're not catching a lot of this and that's just terrible this is this is horrific it really is this is one of the I do, I do true crime everywhere. You know what I mean? Like I go on a lot of shows. This case is disturbing as hell and yeah. uh, more, more, so much more than other ones. It's just, it's such a waste. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was on Nancy Grace last week. She said that and she's covered it all, literally covered it all. Mm -hmm. She says that she thinks this is probably the most disturbing case that she has covered in her uh, iconic true crime career. Sweet and salty here, 11, 11. Uh, can you tell us about Donna's husband? I can tell you uh, he's a quiet man. Is he involved? Not 100% sure, but let's ask the attorney, Steve Webster. Steve Webster, my own mother, who's a therapist and reads people really well, thinks there's no doubt that Harvey Adelson knew what was going on, was helping with the, the transactional side of it, with the finances. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, there's, that, there's the emotional side, the questioning side. There's also the legal side. Is there anything, uh, you know, legally that they can bring him in on, you think? Well, <clears throat> as far as the evidence stands right now i don't know that they have you know the strongest evidence evidence against harvey um you know i personally believe he was involved he's the patriarch i mean i think we can all agree that donna as the matriarch was really you know kind of the strongest figure in that dynamic but he was still the patriarch who they you know charlie and donna were constantly kind of like don't you know trying to tiptoe around the edges you know almost like they were walking on eggshells with him I don't think it's, there's any universe where they just completely do this unbeknownst to him without in, any sort of uh, knowledge, foreknowledge on his part. And frankly, I think that restaurant, uh, the Japanese restaurant meeting after the bump between Harvey and Charlie, that solidifies it for me. I don't buy for a second the explanation that is now on the table, um, which is that that was the first time, you know, that Charlie clued Harvey in to, he, to the fact that he was being extorted by the Latin Kings. So if that conversation wasn't about Charlie being extorted by the Latin Kings, then it was about something else involving the murder of Dan Markell. And the only other thing that leaves as a possibility is the ongoing conspiracy to murder Dan Markell, for which Charlie was a part and parcel and for which Donna has now been charged as being part and parcel of. You know, but, you know, what's really telling and, and I'm not the first person to point this out, but we have to we have to ask it. Like, Where is Harvey? <laughs> They've been married for, what, 50 years or something like that. Right. I don't care. Look, Louis Baptiste, I love you to death, man. If I if, if I need a legal opinion, that's the man I'm going to. Right. But Louis, there's no legal opinion you could ever give me that would prevent me from being in the courtroom where my wife of 50 years is being arraigned for first degree murder. Sorry, bro. Love you. Ain't happening. Right. So where is he? Right. I mean, yeah. to me, that shows consciousness of guilt. What's he afraid of? Right. And like it's so it's so compelling that it keeps him away from his wife right now. 
that that's that's a that's a great point. Uh, the whole uh, absentee Adelson family from Charlie's trial, uh, undoubtedly from Donna's trial. If Wendy's not at Donna's trial, uh, that or Harvey, that speaks volumes. Um, Tommy, I'm going to have you unmute. I'm going to come back, make up a little lost time with you, and then we're going to get back to Lewis from Tom Meredith. Charlie grew his beard, hoping to fit in with the thug prison <laughs> inmates. Um, he's headed down a um, unenviable road. Let's put it that way. But he did look, you know, his his uh, facial hair grown out. Um, he does look tired. Uh, didn't look, you know, the clean, uh, neat guy that they tried to portray him as uh, in court during the trial. What part of you, when you're going to state prison, do you need to prepare for in terms of, you know, taking on a certain image, carrying yourself a certain way so you do not get your proverbial ass kicked in there? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Obviously, if you're a bigger guy, you're better off than if you're a small guy. I mean, there, there's there's obviously something to that. I was, a, I was a big dude and there was a few times that I was happy about that fact, but there's, there's not much you can do. I mean, to prepare yourself, there really isn't. And he, and he's going in there famous. I, I can't imagine going into prison uh, where every single person knows me when I walk in, like that would be the most terrifying thing to me on earth because it's terrifying when you walk in and they don't know you because every single head in the place turns anyway, and they stare at you and they're sizing you up and you know, the conversations are starting. I want to see dudes pay for it, right? All the people are, this dude, everybody knows. And traditionally, this wouldn't be a crime that would have probably, you know, bent the fellas out of shape in all honesty. You know, this is a crime that as crazy as this may sound to the world, wouldn't be considered necessarily dishonorable as nuts as that is, because it isn't uh, of, a, of a sexual nature and there isn't uh, any kids involved. But with the whole Latin King thing, that brings in a, a, just a whole heap of crap for this dude. Um, it's, I, I don't think that, that he's got a, uh, an easy road ahead of him. I really don't. I think that, that that's going to get to him. You guys are in trouble. Cause when Tommy's on, I I'm, I'm fascinated by this. So I, I picked <laughs> his brain on all these little itty bitty questions, but, uh, California girl, uh, when does Charlie get transferred to state prison before that Tommy, he's going to an intake, like, uh, uh, probably not the kind of receptionary that we're thinking of somewhere in the panhandle. And then he's going to get spit out to a state prison, but. What is this intake process like for him on the state level? What is it going to be like? What is he going to have to do? What's going to go on? Okay. When, when you get there, this is the, the prison's way of figuring out who you are. So you're going to have to see a doctor and go through a, a whole medical process. You're going to have to see a lot of people from, uh, from the psych department so that they can kind of figure out who you are. The concept being they're, they're, they want the best placement for that inmate. Uh, so they're going to decide where he goes based on that intake process. But they also want to shake out the people that can't do time. So usually uh, most most fellows refer to it as the fish tank, because when you first get to, to prison, you're referred to as fish. And the fish tank in, in the state joints that I did time in, you were looking at uh, about 38 days of being locked down. You're not doing anything for that 38 days. And if you've never been in that kind of a situation, there are guys that don't do very well with it. And uh, there are people that struggle with that. There's also a lot of like when I did it, things have changed with, with the, the laws. But when I did it, you walked in and you got naked, like the entire row of people got naked while, you know, 70 and 80 cells just mock you and scream things at you. And very often guys didn't even get past that. That was the, the, the part where people went, I can't do this and ask for protective custody. He's a big dude. I don't see him going down that road, but. It's going to be really odd to, to find out what they do f figure to, to do with him in, uh, in intake because he's got just a, there's a bunch here that's going to make him a very interesting inmate to a lot of people. You know, mm. they all think he's rich. Right. Um, I, no matter how big he is, I, I think he's a, a real candidate for extortion. Right? The, the family's already crooked as hell. Right? I don't think anybody's going to be too worried about about whether or not they could squeeze this. Right. They, they've already uh, demonstrated they're willing to walk and go meet people for uh, for that kind of thing. I think that uh, he's he's in for a rough road. I think he's probably going to get blackmailed. And when that doesn't work, you know, all, all bets could be off. And the Latin King thing is really going to be a problem. I promise. Uh, when Tommy speaks uh, in a good way, my palms start to sweat, which they're doing right now. Uh, my uh, It's a cliche, but it is true. This is my worst nightmare that I'm listening to right now. Um, Eileen McCarthy. Uh, perhaps George is going to find that breadcrumb that Steve and uh, Lewis are talking about in the three cell phones and iPads seized with warrants to open uh, dating from June, 2012. Uh, you see Steven's got his fingers crossed two years before the murder. Um, Steve has connected me with a, 
a forensic digital forensic expert up in Tallahassee. Um, I haven't told Stephen this or him, but uh, hoping to have him on uh, Thursday night at seven o'clock. And I've got two other guys that specialize in digital forensics. This could blow the case wide open. So uh, John Sawicki, uh, I'm hoping will join us for that. And uh, we will discuss all of that and how it could impact the case. 5 p.m. tomorrow, just so you know, uh, the, the thumbnail is hashtag justice for Dan Markell. The holidays are coming up. We've got a kind of a YouTube community of content creators. Uh, ask Carl Steinbeck to come on. He can't come on tomorrow night, but the other OGs, uh, mentor lawyer, Asian American legal focus, true lifestyles. And uh, who's the one? Oh, Katie cool lady. How could I forget you? Uh, they'll, they'll all be here tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have a kind of a casual show talking about what justice for Dan Markell means to us. Uh, without further ado, let me play. Uh, there's two more clips to play here, and uh, we'll get Lewis's take on here. I don't think I've heard Lewis this quiet ever, and I don't like that. It's making me nervous, but here we go. Here we go. By the way, this is the first time, and I think the only time, there may have been one other, where Phil references Charlie Adelson. Here we go. The Adelson family, in particular, Charlie Adelson has been a major cause of our heartbreak and the murder of our son, Danny, and the loss of our two grandsons. <clears throat> I have suffered tremendously, and we as a family continue to suffer. It is satisfying to see justice being done, and it would be appropriate to ask for the maximum sentence for the perpetrators of Danny's murder. You know, if you look, I'm going to bring it all the way to here. If you look at Charlie's expression, let's see if we can pick it up here. And it would be appropriate to ask for the maximum sentence for the perpetrators of Danny's murder. One Justice more time. Look at Charlie's done. facial expression. And it would be appropriate to ask for the maximum sentence for the perpetrators of Danny's murder. Now, I look at that. Uh, uh, Lewis, what do you see there? Um, he's shaking his head defiantly this, you know, that he's not the perpetrator is the implication there. I think we see disregard. I think we see callous disregard is what we see. I think the only way to describe it is that um, it's a he totally disregards the real explanation and emotional and raw response that Phil is giving and his response, his reaction to <laughs> is just a is to dismiss it. I mean, it's dismissive. It's disrespectful. It's dismissive. Um, and we know it when he stands up, all he stands up and says is, I've maintained my innocence. That's it. That head nod shows us exactly what he's going to say. That's a, pre that's a prelude into his statement, which was no better. I maintain my innocence. And so what, what it really shows is, even if you didn't do it, Right. Let's create a hypothetical world, because that's what we have to do, where Charlie wasn't involved, where Charlie was extorted by uh, by Maguana and Charlie was forced because he was scared of the Latin Kings. Let's go into Charlie's hypothetical world. Even if that was true. If I was hearing what Phil has gone through. That would still make any regular person have some level of remorse. Not remorse for the, your, the act that you've done, but empathy for the pain that they've experienced. No matter what, you know, if you did it, if you didn't do it, there should still be some level of empathy for the pain that the Markels have experienced every single day, every single second, every single minute. And there was none of that. So what we saw there was a total lack of empathy. You know, he even in his statement, I would have respected it so much more if he stood up and said, look, I'm so sorry for the loss that the Markels are going through. I maintain my innocence. I hate that. What I I would have respected it so much more if there would have been some acknowledgement. I understand as a defense lawyer, I would not want my client to admit any guilt or admit any liability, you know, exp expose himself to anything that could tarnish his chance at appeal. Um, but. I think there was a way to show some empathy for this family while still maintaining your innocence. And we didn't see that at all. All we got was a, a head nod, which I think is just purely disrespectful and dismissive 
of what the Markels have gone through every single day. Interesting and uh, definitely uh, the case. And we're going to play Charlie's statement in a moment. Uh, Stephen, back to you here from Nancy Hendershot. How long before Donna goes to trial? If they wait until after her trial to get Wendy, there is very little hope for those boys. Um, my question to you is, at the arraignment yesterday, and this is a whole other issue, it seems like uh, the Miami attorney is out of her league a little bit. And I, I know they're trying to seek some Tallahassee counsel, and I'm sure that will happen. And uh, Marisol Descalza will not be the permanent counsel for Donna Adelson. But when asked by Judge Everett for the next hearing, Judge Everett suggested February, March, and she stopped him and said, no, we need to do this earlier. It sounds, Stephen Webster, like Donna is itching to go to trial as soon as possible. Is that a wish that could, could, could come back to haunt her? Um, or do you think if you were an attorney, would you advise her to just get this over with? Well, if I'm giving the Adelton's legal advice, you can count <laughs> on it being the absolute opposite opinion of what I truly hold. So <laughs> saying that being said, I 100% encourage them exercising her right to a speedy trial because George is ready to try this case in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that any new counsel is going to be prepared as prepared as Georgia will be and Sarah, Sarah Dugan will be. So I think it's, I think it's a smoke screen. Look, I mean, frankly, it's kind of ludicrous to me. I mean, like what do you, and Judge Everett, you know, he's like, look, I'll put you on the docket if you want, but you know, what purpose does it serve? You know, I mean, what are you really going to be prepared to say in January? You know, I mean, he was offering up March or February and <clears throat> yeah, I got news. There's like a news flash here. There's like a holiday season and a new year between now and the next court date. And there's not going to be a whole lot of depositions and stuff like that happening right now. So I, I you know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of like a weird flex, frankly. And I'm sure Donna will push for it. I believe she will push for it. She does not want to stay in that Leon County Jail. And these people are convinced that they can lie their way out of anything. You know, I mean, Charlie was convinced he was going to be acquitted all the way. He still thinks it. You know, he stands up today. He thinks he can manipulate people still right now into believing he's innocent. That's why he gave that, you know, that little swarmy little statement there about I still maintain my innocence, you know, because he still thinks he can manipulate people after all is said and done. And um, so and so I do believe she'll push that. I don't think it'll happen that way, though, because assuming they actually hire, you know, some some attorneys who are coming in and, and are going to like give her a cogent legal advice, they're going to say, look, we have that, perhaps hundreds of wiretap phone calls to listen to, probably thousands of text messages, emails, you know, not to mention just all of the prior tra trial transcripts and depositions and, and you know, this is not something you can just, you know, jump and put on a put on a jacket and a tie and go try tomorrow. You know, it's going to take months and months. So I think realistically, you're looking at 2026, probably the first part of 2026 is what I would think. Well, that's going to be a long time for Donna Adelson to be sitting in that jail cell. Uh, look, look at this comment. This is fascinating to me. One day, one meal a day, man. I email back and forth with Wendy. If she's emailing with people she barely knows you know, she's burning up the phone with her family. Uh, someone, and I apologize, I passed over it uh, on, a, I think, a super sticker, said they hope that Wendy's boyfriend is law enforcement. I've seen a photo of this guy. He actually looks sort of the part. He looks like he, he could be. That would be uh, unbelievable if that ever turned out to be uh, the case. Tommy Scoville, you know my fascination is not over. So you talked about this intake center. And he's going to be in this cell. How long did you say? And what's he allowed to do? Is he just ruminating in there all Nothing. day long. Okay. Tell us. Yeah. yeah. You're not doing anything. Um, when you get into the uh, intake process, it's usually just your lockdown. The only time you're going to leave that cell is when they take you out to see medical and they usually take you out 10, 12 at a time. It's a process, you know, that never ends because there's new inmates going in every day and guys leaving. But in that first 30 days, you're, uh, you're locked down 23 hours a day. When I did my state rip, they, uh, they only let you out to shower every third day. So you were literally locked down 24 hours a day unless uh, you just happen to be, um, you know, going to see medical or going to see a psych. It's, it's they don't even give you books. The only thing you could get was a Bible in the fish tank. That was the only thing you had access to. And when you go to shower, are you going solo? Where, where And is this like a, uh, you know. They had, they had a, uh, the yeah, there's four single showers on uh, the bottom, four single showers on the top. So when the guys get out, it's an assembly line and you got about three minutes. Well, and when I did it, 
then when I did it, there weren't even no, there were no shower curtains. There was no nothing. It was it was a pretty rough. Uh, it was a pretty rough go. I think they've they've come around quite a bit. Do you get uh, do you get hot water? Is there shampoo? Uh, you, get, uh... you get you get whatever comes out of that uh, thing when you hit the button. Because there's one button, so you you hit that button in, and you get 30 seconds of water. So you hit that button, and you start the process, and then you got your hand tries to find that button again. And uh, yeah, it's not a it's not a pleasant shower. I, I promise, it's not a pleasant Tommy shower. Tommy when when you wake you up every day, you, you know, yeah, like when, you when you wait, sorry to interrupt, but when you wake up every day, uh, the the smallest things like getting in the shower, like being able to toast your own bagel, do you um do you, do you look up at the sky and go, wow, I'm so grateful that I can do this and I can do it on my own with without fail every single day of my life. I, I don't miss a sunrise and I don't miss a sunset. And uh, I like grass between my toes. Um, I have a cat right next to me. I like furry little animals. And uh, and the uh, the smells of the uh, real world are lovely, right? The smells on the inside of that place are not. It's just, you know, it smells like fear and uh, and depression. And when you uh, get in the real world, it's, uh, it's just lovely. And, you, you know, you, it definitely changes you. I think that uh, one way or the other, right? Guys either become... A worse criminal. That's what happened on my first couple of sentences. Um, and then the last one broke me. You know, I, it really did. I uh, walked out looking at life really different. But yes, I, I every single day without fail. I keep telling Tommy Scoville, he's got to write a book, man. He's got stories for days. Uh, things that he's told me are unbelievable. He's got to write a book and I've got a publisher for him. I'm going to put him in touch. Um, I know, uh, Lewis, this is not your field of expertise, but I'm just curious uh, your perspective. Uh, the big question now, we just talked about Wendy, if something were to happen and she's taken into custody. And by the way, she's said to not be a very adept single parent. Um, she has trouble making appointments. She's always asking uh, people that she knows to, you know, run the kids here, run the kids there. Um, you know, I'm getting information from sources. Um, how problematic, obviously, is it if she was to be taken into custody? What do you have any idea what would happen to these boys or what could or should? So it would be an extremely technical process. It would fall under what we, we have in Florida called Florida uh, Statute Chapter 39. And so at Florida Statute Chapter 39, the entire series, it sets out the course of where children go if the parents can't have them, right? Lewis, I got to stop you for one sec. Webster, does this guy know like chapter and verse, all the Civ yeah. Pro books, all criminal law? Yeah. What's going on here? He's citing... I I, I tell him my passwords just so he can remind me what they are. <laughs> this is insane. Go ahead. I didn't mean to drop. It, it's Sarah. So chapter 39 set out the standard where the only way a parents can have their rights terminated are abuse, abandonment, or neglect. And so what that means is even if Wendy's arrested, that does not automatically mean that her rights are terminated at that moment. What that means is if, if she's arrested for this crime, then the state would have to bring a DCF, presumably, presumptively, would bring a hearing against her, what's called a TPR hearing, which is termination of parental rights. Um, and as part of that TPR hearing, um, the court would then evaluate what's the best placement for the boys. Uh, and, the, and here's the problem I think that exists that we're not really talking about is that if Wendy's arrested and her rights aren't terminated, so let's say that she's arrested tomorrow in our, in, a, in our utopic world, but there is no TPR or no shelter here. Whenever the state takes any children out of a home, you have to have a shelter hearing within 48 hours. 72 is the deadline. 48 is what the statute advises. You have to have a shelter here. And so if Wendy's arrested tomorrow and the children aren't sheltered, which means taken into the custody of the state, Wendy will have the ability, ability to designate where the kids go. The statute says that until there's a TPR, parental preference is in control. This has been litigated up to the, up to the DCA. And so we, there could be a world where Wendy is arrested and there's not a TPR and where Wendy is directing for the children to go with a third party that isn't the Markels. And the problem is, the Markels could theoretically petition for custody, but the only way, you know, of course, there's a statute which was passed, um, you know, uh, the Markel statute, which might bring the relief they're looking for. Thank God. But outside of the statute and any or conviction and the judge making any kind of findings, um, 
the Barkel's best bet would be for custody by an extended family member, which is what they're considered. Problem there is, I mean, this is this really is going to bring a legal situation because in order to file a motion for custody by extended family member, that family member has to be in custody of the child or had had custody in the previous 18 months, right? So theoretically, if the Wendy was arrested tomorrow, the Markells would not be in custody of Lincoln or Benjamin, nor, nor can they assert in a pleading that they have had custody for the past 18 months. And so their only relief would be a finding from the court based on the Markell statute, the Markell Act that was passed. Um, but it is a situation, it could firmly exist where Wendy could be arrested and direct for the children to go with a third party in the absence of the court sheltering the children and directing otherwise. Wow. Man, Dan would be proud. <laughs> yeah, super. Yeah, he sure would. Uh, Lewis, a student, knows the law. Uh, Linda Smart, glad she brought this up. Is there a possibility to print Phil Markell's impact statement because the feed was so bad? I could pick up the extreme emotions and a word here and there, but overall miss so much of it. I'm going to reach out to him, number one, to, uh, you know, see how he's doing. And I'm going to ask him if he can give us a copy. And uh, if so, I'm going to post it on Twitter at Podcast STS and on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor uh, so people can read it because it was definitely uh, really emotional and, and, and heart wrenching. Stephen Webster, back to you. So this was coming up at the very beginning of this chat feed. Uh, a lot of people were asking an appeal. There's no doubt that Charlie Adelson is going to try to appeal this conviction, but everyone tries to appeal, right? What are the chances? Uh, is there any scenario in your mind where he gets out of this uh, conviction? I, I, I put it in the same realm of possibility of Donna Adelson getting house arrest. And we saw how that went for her yesterday. Uh, now, I, I, you know, I watched, I didn't watch every part of the trial. I was under subpoena. And so I was sequestered, but you know, I just got the sense in the little bit that I was able to observe that, you know, Judge Everett was literally he was he was in some respects, he was trying to protect the record from the defense. There was one instance where the defense was pushing for all of the text messages to come in as a composite exhibit. It was after I had testified and been released from my subpoena. And the the judge seemed to have concerns about some sort of kind of racial epithets or some racially insensitive language that might be in some of the text messages. And he said he was going to exclude those under a 403 analysis that they might inflame the jury. And he said, he looked, I mean, if I, if I recall this correctly, he looked at Mr. Rashbaum and said, you know, Mr. Rashbaum, like, you know, you have some, some folks on this jury that really may not have, but by your client and some of his other people that he was communicating with. So no, I put, I put it at, I never say never, you know, but at as as infinitesimal above you know zero percent as you can go i see no and that's why the judge anyway he stacked on counts two and three 30 and 30 consecutive so even if somehow you know um there was some sort of appeal that you know there was some successful appeal as to count one and the, you know the murder um you know he would still have to get around uh, the counts two and three and the 30 and 30 that he's staring down the barrel on there. So Charlie Adelson is going to die in a Florida state penitentiary. Oh my God. That's freaky. Uh, Tommy unmute yourself uh, from SRA. Did Tommy know any lifers? How much does having a release date mean when serving a sentence? That's question number one. Um, yeah, I had my custody level um, was high. So when I started my sentence, I started it on a yard where, probably about 50% of the people there were lifers. So I knew a bunch of them. Uh, having a uh, um, an out date changes your life. I mean, it's very, very different, obviously, for the people who are uh, who are lifers. But it also changes the dynamic of the prison. When you, when you have a place where there's a bunch of guys that are doing life, um, that's hard for them to watch people that uh, come and go, you know? And so you do everything within your power to not talk about it. You're not, you're not pumping your fist in the air and saying you got 60 days left because the guy sitting at the table with you ain't getting out so um and where was lewis when i was uh when i was yeah. going to court what the hell is, you know my, my lawyer took six months looking stuff up and uh he's <laughs> just rattling this off the top of his head lewis lewis will be coming in citing you know chapter and verse of all the memory law books um katie girl here tommy scoville were you able to exfoliate and get your mud mask on in prison she says she could not survive the 30 second shower she would need more time 
to exfoliate. Did you get your mud mask on ever, Tommy? Oh, and would oh, you get your yeah, would you get your ass beat walking around with a mud mask in a state prison? <laughs> You're not gonna believe this, but I've actually seen it. Uh, yeah. or something very similar. Uh, there are there are people that do some pretty crazy things in there, but uh, <laughs> to be clear. The water comes out 30 seconds at a time. You can stay in there for, for 10 minutes if you can deal with the guy behind you not wanting to, uh, to wait 10 minutes. But you also have to have somebody stand in there watching you, right? You don't go to the shower alone. So when you go to the shower, you need to have one of your fellas wearing boots to make sure that nobody wants to come on in there and, uh, and help you out with the process. Mm, so the shower is, is not fun. You'd love it. My Tommy, <laughs> hold on. I just want to hold on a second, everyone. Are you telling me that every time you shower, you have to have someone you are friends with? I don't know what the word is in there. Who is suited literally? What's that? What's a, what's the phrase? Suited and booted, ready suited to ready to fight with a weapon. Usually, yeah, sitting in a chair with boots on, with his back to you, and you go in and shower. And God forbid your cell, you're a white guy or a black guy, and your cell is closest to the shower because if they can't find their homeboy, they're grabbing the first white dude, the first black dude of the you know the matching race, and saying, "Hey, watch me." I never wanted a cell anywhere near the uh, the showers because you inevitably end up trying to uh, people try to get you to go sit and watch. And uh, yeah, I wasn't you, doing that. If prison is not a deterrent, after Tommy, you got to write this book. So you lit what? Hold on a second. So let's just say I go into prison. What about the first couple of times you shower? I'm going. Let's say you're Charlie Adelson. The first time he showers, he's not going to even know anyone. The, What's going on? Now, normally what happens is the, when you get there, there's going to be somebody um, from your car, right? And the car is either the state you're from, uh, the color of your skin. It just keeps going down into smaller cars. It originally starts with the color of your skin and goes down from there. But people will bring you up to speed. And, it, and that's at the higher custody levels. And where our boy is going, he's going to need someone to watch him when he takes a shower. He's going to be at, he's doing life in prison, man. This is, this is uh, the highest custody level you're getting. And yeah, you're not going to the shower if you don't have somebody to watch you. That's just the way it is. And that's every shower you take at that custody level without fail. So for the rest of his life, he's got to have, what is it? Booted and suited. Is that what yeah, you said? Suited, suited and booted. Suited and booted. You, you got your boots on there. They're laced up and ready to go. And normally if it's your guy, he's, he's holding a weapon, you know, because if someone is going to come and get you, that's a very popular time to do it. Right. It's not too difficult. You know, it's easier to fight someone when they're, they're naked and not carrying a weapon. So you have somebody that sits there and watches your back when you shower. You have to have a, a partner. Um, so you is find it, one quickly. Is anyone else like freaked out hearing this or is it just me? Because someone says Joel's prison fear just escalated times 100. <laughs> My God, I hope I never, ever, ever get myself in trouble. Ned Smith says naked and afraid. Um, yeah. Well, Steve you know, Webster. if you get a DWI, you're not going to these custody levels. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it requires stupidity to end up at these custody levels. This is doing really dumb stuff. It's not making a mistake. Then you go to a place where people shower and walk around and high five. But if you end up at custody levels where you got gangbangers and you got, you know, there's a lot of what they call politics, which is just a, a way to, to um, it's just racial hate, right? And it goes in a bunch of directions and it's ugly as hell. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want anything to do with it. I, 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 I'm just glad I'm not the only one. Hey, Mona says I'd be petrified. Someone else says uh, that I'm too. Um, I, I got through it. I don't like talking. You know, it, honestly, it, it, it still creeps me out. <laughs> it really does. Do you have, PTSD, I'm on you have PTSD in the shower ever? You ever think someone's coming to get you in the shower now? Do you know what's really funny is I hate showers. I had this conversation with somebody the other day. Uh, prison room showering for me, 100%. And it's not because I think someone's coming in. It's just that you spend so much time having this be something that you don't relax doing. You jump in, you get it done as fast as you can and you get out and you do that for over a decade. It's very hard for me to just go in there and enjoy a shower. It really is. It's, uh, uh, yeah. If people but, don't find this fascinating, I don't know. This is really amazing to me. Uh, look at this question. Joel, would you rather be in the Adelson family or the Latin King family? Uh hundred percent, the latter hundred percent. Uh, yeah, they've got uh, they've got loyalty. Let, speaking of that, let's listen to um, someone just said, I think their anxiety is off the charts. Where is that? Because uh, I'm literally my palms are sweating. I don't like I, I'm, I'm so fascinated by this, but uh, I'm also scared to hear it. So here's Charlie. Here's uh, Charlie's statement. Let's uh, let's take a listen together. Uh, notice his body language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here we go. This is Charlie Adelson uh, given a chance to speak at his sentencing today. Very well, Mr. Adelson, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make a statement if you wish. You do not have to speak. 
However, this is your opportunity if you choose to do so. I do. You may stand. Sam. I would just like to say that I maintain my innocence. Well, what a heartfelt statement. Uh, let's let's watch that one more time since it was so long. Hang on one second. Here we go. Well. One more time. Here we go. Very well. Mr. Adelson, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make a statement if you wish. You do not have to speak. However, this is your opportunity if you choose to do so. I do. You may stand. Sam. I would just like to say that I maintain my innocence. It was weird there, Lewis. I don't know if you picked that up, but when the judge said you can stand, he repeated the word stand. And uh, I've heard that he likes to repeat things. It's weird, almost like an OCD thing. So I don't know. I just I, I just picked up on that. Um, obviously not very uh, emotional, not very heartfelt. What's your take on this? Is this just him trying to save face in case of an appeal? I think that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing him trying to presume and maintain his status as of being innocent. Um, Problem for him is he just doesn't know the first DCA. Uh, the first DCA is 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 an extremely tough DCA to go before as an appellant, and so just like Webster, I couldn't agree with Webster more. That's that a that's chance, a district. I'm sorry, district court of appeals, correct? For people who don't know, yes, sir. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the first and so Florida's now broken down into it just changed six DCAs, so six district courts of appeals, uh, and they're based on where you are geographically. Depends on where you land. Uh, in Tallahassee, we're under the first DCA. And so the first DCA is tough. Um, and so, again, I, 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 the chances of his appeal are, you know, as close to zero as possible. I watched the trial, the entire trial. And um, look, it, Judge Everett did a great job. And, and I'll answer this question. It's not being directly posed, but a lot of people throughout the day were saying, why wasn't Judge Everett tougher? Why didn't he dress him down? And I think what and I think, you know, because a lot of times we see the judge, you know, dress the defendant down for the actual crime. I think in this case, uh, Judge Everett wanted to remain impartial. So that's why Judge Everett couldn't do that, because if Judge, if Judge Everett dresses down Charlie Adelson, it makes it seem as if he's <clears throat> taken a position, then that might give him a conflict in judging Donna's case, because it can appear that he's now he's no longer impartial. And so I think that Judge Everett did exactly what he needed to do and not dressing him down. I think that uh, and so it, him not dressing him down was necessary because if he did dress him down, he could have created an appellate issue for Donna or for Charlie. And so by him not doing that, I think he did exactly what he needed to do. And this is why I say best guess, better community. But listen to that. It's something I had no idea about, the nuance there. But it's true. Judge Everett was going to preside over Don Adelson's case. And we saw in the Alec Murdoch trial uh, with Judge Clifton Newman, that, who everyone loved, he dressed down Alec Murdoch. He basically humiliated him uh, and took it to him. But he didn't have another trial coming up. So uh, that's interesting distinction that Lewis made there. Bill Davis with a super sticker here for uh, Stephen Webster. These guys are probably getting tired, but let's go a few more minutes because I love these guys and uh, love hearing uh, their takes on this. When I've heard you tell that story about first hearing that Dan was shot, you said they killed him. Did you believe that the Adelson side was responsible from the get-go, uh, Stephen? Well, this is kind of a strange coincidence, but <clears throat> when I um, was representing Dan at the time of his murder, I was actually sharing office space with an attorney named Bill Davis. So Mr. Davis, um, I don't think it's the same Mr. Davis, uh, but I never, as I said last week, you know, I, I never for a second entertained the possibility or idea that, that Charlie Adelson and his cohorts would uh, conspire to murder Dan. But when uh, the police officer that I was speaking to on the phone, who I knew pretty well, you know, it's clear to me looking back on it now that she was treating me as a suspect, as she should. At that point, I was one of the last people to call Dan. I was I called him three minutes after he was shot. Um, so she needed to know why the heck I was calling Dan Markell and what my relationship with him was. Um, <clears throat> so 
she was pretty aggressive in her tone uh, when she was speaking to me. And when I mistakenly concluded that, you know, Wendy or somebody had, a, you know, Wendy had accused Dan of some sort of domestic violence, uh, which I had warned Dan I was worried about because it's something that happens in uh, family law situations where people try to gain a tactical advantage by false making false allegations of domestic violence. So when I went there thinking that's what the officer was calling me about, um, and I kind of pushed back aggressively, she immediate she immediately, I think, sensed that Stephen doesn't have anything to do with this. And then when she realized he was my client, I think she probably on some levels felt like she was in a real bad position with me. And like, how what do I say right here to him? Um, and so when she she said to me, you can't talk to him. And I said, no, yes, I can. I represent him right now. I want to speak to my client. And she said, you can't because something really bad has happened to him. And like I said before, and I've said it a few times, you know, since it happened, I can't explain it to anybody. Um, but those words hit me and they literally went all the way down my spine to my feet. And I knew it at that moment that he was dead. And I believed right away that the Adelsons were somehow involved. Some, you know, faction of the Adelsons were responsible. And I, I immediately thought to myself, they killed him. And um, she eventually confirmed that he was dead, that he had been shot. Well, she didn't say he was dead, but she confirmed for me that he had been shot. And um, so, yeah, I, I did. I, I believed it right away. Well, and that was uh, nine and a half plus, or nine plus years ago. Uh, back to Tommy Scoville here is going to have to uh, unmute. I'm sorry, uh, Lewis, did, were you flagging me there? I had a question for Tommy myself, but I'll wait to yours. I had a no, question no, no, go for ahead. Myself. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here's what I wonder. All my clients tell me that, you know, prison is like a different America in a sense of, you know, the racial divides that used to exist in the country still very well exist and are strong in prison. And so um, I, in, in that, in a, in a way, they provide a new inmate with protection. You know what I mean? Because you can either if you're black, you hang with the blacks. If you're Haitian, you go with the Haitians. If you're Hispanic, you go with the Latin Kings or MS-13. You know, if you're white, you go with the whites. And so, you know, what, what does that, I mean, what does that mean for Charlie though? Because, you know, he's like, you know, he's Jewish. And so that's like a different, you know, just being, being honest. Oh, that's being a different honest. place. Let me tell you something too. It's, uh, let me just chime in for one second. As a Jewish guy myself, this is not the best time uh, in our history to be, uh, you know, I'm very proud to be Jewish. Love it. But uh, anti-Semitism is at an all time high. Someone brought this up the other day. But Tommy Scoville, very interesting question. Your uh, take. Well, um, it's a different form of anti-Semitism in prison than it is on out here. As bad as it is out here, um, I can't think of a race that uh, has it uh, worse in, in prison. You know, they don't fit in with the white boys because the white boys are primarily Nazis. I mean, if they're if they're ganged up, right, if they're tipped up, then they have SWAT stickers on them. Right. Um, and, you know, that that really becomes an issue. So, uh, yeah, there's nowhere for him to go. Um, and I saw a comment that said, you know, the, he's probably going to become a, a prison thug. No, he's not. Like, I, I, I just don't see that happening. There's white guys are really going to to shun this dude. Right. They're really that that the hatred of uh, of and the the segregation of races in there is so real. It's incredible. I, you know, I my. My story is I, I got I got saved in prison. A guy helped me get sober. And the dude that helped me get sober was black. And if you knew the crap that I that like it was a bad situation for the entire time it happened. It really was. It's not ideal. You do not. You just don't associate outside your race. And the, he, there's not going to be a Jewish car. There's not going to be six you know Jewish dudes waiting there to welcome him in. You know, they don't. I've never been to a yard where there was a Jewish car. I've been to a couple of yards where there were Jewish dudes. But they, they, there's never four or five, so there's no one to have your back. It's a le to really a legit point. He's in a lot of a lot of trouble going in. Yeah. Well, what about the what about the Perry Adonis gang? I mean, can you think he can hook up with them? <laughs> you know what's really funny though? Like that may be his ace in the hole. Is that just the the small amount of medical training? Like you know, if a veterinarian gets busted, he's the he's the prison doctor, right? Like he's mm -hmm. the guy that stitches oh, up someone that gets shot or whatever. I mean, that gets uh, stabbed or whatever. We don't. You know, you try to do everything you can to not go down to medical because when you go down to medical, you get shipped. If somebody gets in a fist fight or whatever, you're off the yard, you're done. 
So usually there's somebody that takes care of that kind of stuff. And I would imagine that's his probably only hope he has of is being useful. Um, and the other one being money. If he can get his people to, you know, to send money on the green dot card, you know, to, to people on the street, he might be able to buy some, uh, some, you know, some goodwill, but the white guys aren't going to be real happy about the, the, uh, the gang thing either. In, in spite of the fact that that gang is not, you know, a white gang, he's still not going to get much respect for, uh, for what he did from any of the gangs. Like the gangs aren't going to uh, take to him. He's a, this really is not a guy that's, he's going into the worst situation. I used to say Danny Masterson, nobody in the world's going into a situation worse than Danny Masterson because of what, but he's in the running. Um, the, the Jewish thing is really going to be a problem for him, sadly. Uh, and I don't mean sadly for him because he's a piece of crap, but that, that, that it still exists like this, you know? Yeah. And um, Danny, and it, 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 is so Danny that, Ma is Danny Masterson because of his celebrity or because of the crimes or everything? The crimes. He's you know they were they were of a of a, uh, a sexual nature and inside there's just no respect for that at all. Like there's yeah. just no respect for that at all. And he's going to a California yard. So I thought about that, but but you know this is a big dude, which means that he's probably going to do what he can to defend himself. You know, really small guys get beat up and leave yards. Big guys tend to try to fight, and sometimes that's not the best thing. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing is just to get your ass kicked and move on. And I don't, he doesn't impress me as that kind of guy. He might need to, to, uh, to learn. So, so Tommy, let me ask you this. Um, how long is it going to take? Cause you can sit there and hear a judge say, you've just been sentenced to life in prison and you can think about it, but when is it going to hit him that this is his new life? When he walks through the, the door into his unit, not when he gets to the prison and all that, but, Usually um, the prisons are now started being built so that, you know, the yards are on the inside and the buildings are on the outside. You're going to walk through a bunch of crap. But when you get to your unit and you walk inside that door and that's your home, like that, that's it. The reality of this is where I live uh, sinks in right around the time you cross that threshold. And as I said earlier in the show, every single head in that place, the conversations are going to stop. It's like a movie. Everybody stops talking. The cards stop turning and everybody just turns and looks. And when all of those eyes are on you, you know, there's that split second of the hell was I thinking Robin Banks, you know what I mean? And he's going to be dealing with that at a much different level, you know? And there was, I saw a question where someone asked about if he was going to, you know, the, his statement, that statement he made, the fellows are actually probably going to respect the fact that he didn't tell on himself. That's a big deal. They like guys that don't, but he could have got up without telling on himself and really probably been a human being. You know what? My, you know, I feel feel awful for the kids. I, that he's just a sick bastard. But no, I, I don't think he's going to get any uh, ill will for that. But yeah. a couple more questions for Tommy. Uh, can Charlie spend for Marianne? Can Charlie spend his money in prison? Love from Denmark. Uh, Denmark uh, probably a little more uh, passive. You know, more of a pacifist kind of nation than uh, the United States. But he's uh, going to get extorted. Yeah, yeah what's going on with his money there? Yeah, you could spend a fortune in prison. You would not believe how much money you can spend. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the the amount of money that drugs cost in prison, um, what would cost ten dollars on the street costs about two hundred and fifty, right, for heroin. So, the people that are in there doing drugs are spending unbelievable amounts of money, right? Unbel and they will give it to you. You know, it's not like you're handing them cash, right? There's no, there is no fiat, right? So, what you do is you uh, they hand you it, and then your people need to pay from the street. And if you don't, then bad things tend to happen. Right. And it's very often families get pulled in and they uh, they end up running to Western Union a lot, you know, mm -hmm. or, or sending money to these people or that people. And it's very often the family ends up doing time with the uh, person who gets sent in, because if they're not if they don't clean up their act and they're going to require an awful lot of assistance from the street just to stay, you know, alive. But you can definitely spend your money. In there well, uh, this comment to uh, Tommy, I think, is your shower story. Does everyone have a weapon in prison? How many people do have them? Not, no, not everybody uh, has a weapon in prison. There are a lot of people that like, and I've said this before, if you show up now, he's going to be an exception to this rule because of, he's famous, but guys have shown up on prison yards, walked in and said, you know what? I have a very strong belief in a higher power. This is what I believe. I'm not doing anything. I'm not putting in work. I'm not doing any of this. And believe it or not, the fellows will go great. Like that crew sits over there in the corner. But if you get drunk or you get high or you start acting like the rest of the fellows do, then, then we're going to treat you like the rest of the fellows. So there are groups of small groups that they're not carrying weapons. No one's messing with them. They go do their things. He's not going to be that group, right? That the, the fact that he's Jewish really is going to be an issue. 
a really, I think the biggest issue for him, even more so than the gangs, is going to be the fact that he's he's going in there. It's not, it's just really a, a horrifically racist place, you know? Uh, Lewis, a uh, question, and we'll start to wrap up in just a couple of minutes. I've taken too much of these guys' time. we got to get the bovine story from Webster before we go. Uh, <laughs> the story of that, that, that photo, if that's what it is. If Charlie flips, uh, Lewis... What's the best sentence he could get? Uh, someone today, earlier today, and I, I, I think it was uh, Jeremy Mutz, who was in, formerly in the prosecutor's office up in Tallahassee, said there's no motivation really for the state to make a deal with Charlie. But uh, do you see a possible deal and uh, how would it play out? I don't. I don't see a possible deal. I think we and I think the, the, the proof that I don't think a deal is likely is in the fact that Magbuana still doesn't have one. The fact is that she came and she testified. In Charlie's trial, and I know a lot of people thought it was controversial, but I think she gave, you know, compelling testimony. And I think that post that testimony, there's still no deal. Her, she still hasn't been brought to has been brought back to court. Her sentence hasn't been renegotiated. And so I don't believe there's any real possibility for a deal because if Katie didn't get one for coming to trial to testify against Charlie, I definitely don't think I definitely don't see the state giving one, Charlie one for testifying against Donna. Okay. First point. Second point I would make is the reason I think there was no deal is because if you look at the lawyer, I was wondering this too. We talked about it on your last show. If if the Miami lawyer couldn't talk to Donna, how did she get the information for her motion? Is the question we all asked ourselves on your show, you know, last week. We found out in court yesterday that she said that she got the information from Roshbaum is where she got the information which tells me that Rashbaum was talking to Donna and still talking to Charlie, right? And so that tells me that that is still a team, right? The fact that Rashbaum was meeting with Charlie, stopped meeting with Charlie, presumably met or spoke to Donna while he was at the jail meeting with Charlie, tells me that, that is still a team operating as one unit. So I don't see him flipping likely. And if he was going to flip, he would have, that's set point two. And last point, point three, is that if he was going to flip, I think he would have showed some remorse. I think the fact that he maintained his innocent, his innocence, even in that in that callous video that we saw, um, the disrespectful video that we saw, I think it shows that, you know, uh, he's, he's ride or die. And unfortunately, like I said, I think Webster says that he's going to die in prison, in, in prison. And I think that, you know, I think, and I, I can't speak to this, but I think Tommy can speak to this because a lot of the guests don't know is that in Florida, there's like four different custody levels. And I think, and, I think, and so, you know, the, he's he's going to be the maximum custody level. Hmm. That's a big difference. Tommy That's Scoville, a, um, does, I mean, will prison break you uh, his first couple months to the point that he might think about flipping on his mom? Uh, you know what? I, I was in prison with a dude who literally was almost in the same situation. It was a drug dealing thing though, but uh, he actually cut a deal on a, a brother, a sister, and a mom. So there are people out there that, that do um, as crazy as this whole family is, there's obviously some kind of weird family dynamic. This dude was willing to kill for somebody in the family, right? So there is loyalty in this family. It's just sick and, and wrong and, and screwed up, but uh, yeah, I, I don't see him. Uh, I don't see that happening. I really don't. It's I don't be, know what he could get out of it. Who would help him? What, yeah, that's got to be looked him? on really negatively within the prison walls, though, to flip on your mom, right? Oh, they would kill him. Yeah, I mean, that would be even, yeah, that would, <laughs> you definitely, flipping in general. I mean, if you tell anybody, that's that's considered really bad for him, you know? So, and he's going to be at a custody level four. This dude's not going to be any place but the, the absolute worst, at least in the beginning. And then when you do your time and your custody level drops, and that's doing time without getting in trouble and doing everything right. Your custody level drops and he can hope to get to a slightly nicer facility. But he's not starting out there. I promise you. Yeah, and, and Tommy, you were talking before about how inmates are going to know uh, even about his statement today. How does news travel so fast in the prison system? They're going to know all this before he even gets there. Oh, yeah. They, they, uh, they have TVs all over the entire place. Most of them have them in their cells. In the uh, federal system, that's not a, a, a thing. But in the state system, you can buy a television set for yourself. So these guys right on their bunk. I mean, they, and I promise you, true crime, that was huge when I was in when I was inside. That's everybody's favorite subject, as crazy as that is, right? Um, but and they do they have the uh, the old rabbit ears with the aluminum foil? Or where, how they get cable. The, Basic cable. cable. 
basic cable. There's a wow. little uh, little thing that comes out of the wall and you get basic cable. It's about uh, when I was in, it was 26, uh, 26 channels. Wow. You know, basic cable. You didn't get any uh, you didn't get any HBO or any of that, but you got basic cable. Wow, well, maybe my whole outlook on prison just changed just now. Oh, oh yeah, that, 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 uh, that definitely makes it. You'd love it. You get your own room and some TV. Look at this from hey. not. I need to get away from my kids. Go ahead, Webster. And if anything happens to the TV, Charlie's right there to fix it for you, man. So, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Man, he's got it. He's got it down. We, we teed that one up for you from Nacho's mom, and I promise we're wrapping it. As for Tommy, did I hear you correctly, Tommy? Did you say on your channel, uh, uh, Lifeboat? That they don't, I always want to say love boat. That's why I always hesitate there. Uh, did you say in your channel that they don't give psych meds in a prison? No, no. I think you, uh, if, in, if I said something that, that gave that impression, I apologize. They give out a ton of psych meds in prison. They love giving out psych meds in prison. They want everybody on psych meds in prison. And Tommy just said this. Oh, wait. Thanks to our best guests for being so generous with their time and sharing their insight. Can't say that again. There was a comment there asking if, if, uh, Charlie's definitely going to start off on a level four. He is. Uh, Joel, look at this, scaring me already. If you disrespect your mom, you may might end. I just wrote a book about my beautiful mother. I should get accolades. Um, I, I, want, I always think, like, what would I have to do in prison? I would just have to be totally crazy. I'd be swatting at imaginary flies and make everyone just think I'm completely out of my mind. That would be my only hope. Um, listen, these are uh, some of the best, best guests. I just um, took up more of their time than I should have. Uh, you just heard from Tommy Scoville. This guy was a professional skier. Uh, he got injured, got hooked on some uh, pain meds that got him into Robin Banks. One thing led to another. Listen, I've had, I have every week, Phil Waters, uh, America's most respected detective on. He says, any person under the right circumstances can commit a horrible uh, evil and uh, Tommy found himself in um, some pretty uh, difficult circumstances, and that's why uh, you know he ended up where he did. But this guy turned his life around. Tommy, tell us about uh, Lifeboat. You should, by, by the way, start the, the Love Boat channel as well. Yeah, and you know, uh, I mean, it's kind of a love boat. You know, <laughs> we, we started out uh, we started out with the concept that uh, you know what people go to uh, to meetings for AA and NA, and you got to stand up and say hi, how you doing? I'm Tommy, and I'm a heroin addict. And, that's really difficult. A lot of people, you know, don't like public speaking. A lot of people wouldn't sit in front of a camera like this for all the money on the, on the planet. So giving somebody a digital medium, that was the idea. They could come and talk about it. No one was staring at them. And, it, and what we found was that um, a lot of people just sort of came that didn't have drug problems. And, and there's just sort of a connection thing that happens with people who are kind of like minded and um, sort of drugs and mental health. That's kind of what the lifeboat does because we're all in the same boat. And it's it's been amazing. It's got out of control. I, I had no idea what was going to happen. These uh, these people built a huge channel and let me talk into the microphone. So it's been fun. Wow, that's but, awesome. Yeah. Continued continued success. Look at this universal man. I can't bring it up for some reason. Well, I can right now. Uh, Stephen, I want to get to you on this question. What kind of temperament did Wendy have during the divorce? If you can fill us in a little bit. Look at this. You, uh, we're at 89K. Thank you. Let's keep adding people and get more subscribers and uh, build a community. Dan has well-wishers in West Africa. I'm blown away by this because I, I read the, some of the list of the uh, countries that were in the chat today. But now we can add Senegal and Gambia. Uh, good job, Joel. God bless. Thank you for tuning in. I was in Tanzania and Rwanda, believe it or not. We were just talking about this years ago for a honeymoon. It was my dream to go to the Serengeti to see those wild animals uh, in their natural habitat. And uh, Rwanda has gorillas. Most incredible trip of my life. In Amazing. We we have some friends that are doing something similar, but uh, I will never forget that. By the way, speaking of engagement rings and weddings, um, the cab driver, this story is very short. I'll make it very quick, but there's a, a moral to this story. We're in Rwanda and the cab driver said, excuse me, sir, I have to ask you, why does your wife have that on her finger? And uh, she had her engaged. She was wearing a, like a substitute ring uh, for traveling. And he said, in our country, we would never do something so stupid as to give someone a ring. We give them goats so they can feed their family with milk and food. And uh, that's when I said, that's a pretty smart thing to do. And uh, we can be morons here in the United States. So less rings, more goats. That's the moral of the story. Less rings, more goats. Um, Stephen Webster, 
Did you get any inkling, any any insight into Wendy's temperament uh, as this was all going on? I know you were talking to Dan, but did you hear anything from Wendy's side? I mean, <clears throat> from the from, from the papers, and especially with you know hindsight, you know her mo was to lie, deceive, and play the victim. You know that was pretty much what she did. You know, um, and you know I don't know that anything has changed. Uh, Ned Smith, did you ask for her ring back? Uh, it's a good idea. They could ask for it back. Very smart idea. Uh, Stephen Webster is one half of Webster and Baptiste Attorneys at Law. Stephen, just your final thoughts tonight, and then we'll pivot to Lewis and close this bad boy out. Thank you for giving me an opportunity here to say kind of what I want to say here. Um, you know, my wife, um, her, her brother was killed by a, a drunk driver uh, when she was a young girl. Sorry and um, yeah, you know, and I learned, I've learned a lot. She's taught me a lot, you know, about that. And one of the things she's taught me is the worst thing that can happen is when people don't remember her brother. You know, you think when you're on the outside looking in, you worry if I walk up and if I, if I bring up, you know, his name, will that hurt her? Will that make her depressed or feel bad? And she's taught me, no, it's the opposite is true. When people don't remember, don't speak about her brother. Um, that's what hurts. So I want to begin by remembering once again, Dan Markell and the wonderful man that he was um, and the, the amazing father, son, and brother. And that brings me to my next point that I'll end with. You know, everybody focuses on the loss of the mother and father. I just think it's natural. You know, their loss is incalculable. Um, and it's 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 terrible. Um, but there's a sister out there, too, just like my wife, who lost a brother. And that's Shelly Markell. And I just want to say, Shelly, we know you're hurting. And we know it. Thank you. Always eloquent. By the way, uh, I am a mama's boy, and she knows I have a podcast. So those are my kids, but my mom is FaceTiming me once again in the middle of a podcast that she knows I'm doing. She just doesn't care. Giovanni's Pikachu. I'm going to walk my goat right after this. Uh, this comment here. I want a ring and a goat from uh, Ned Smith. He's got a great sense of humor. Danielle Alexander, goats, goats. Look at this. Larry Rubin. Coming to us from the great city of Newark, New Jersey, uh, once a uh, Jewish capital of New Jersey, uh, one a long time ago, a generation ago, not far from uh, where I grew up. Uh, Southern Charm, great show. Louis Baptiste is the other half, and he gets the final word tonight. Louis, uh, this was a pretty remarkable day, nine plus years in the making. Charlie's day of reckoning, his comeuppance, as I said at the beginning. Uh, as you and Stephen have pointed out, he is likely never, ever, ever going to see the light of day again. Stephen said he will likely die in state prison. Your final thoughts on this uh, monumental day? You know, I, I end I end this show like I end every time I talk about Professor Markell is that I'm a big believer in God, big believer in Jesus, and I just ask that we pray for his family um, and that we pray for his boys and we pray for their peace. We pray that God continues to give them grace and cover them with his mercy. Um, it's a nightmare, you know, for us, we comment on it. People from across the world, we talk about it. Your show draws in thousands and thousands and thousands of people to talk about it. Um, but we just know that while we're talking about it for the Markels, this is real. You know, this is, this is um, their brother. You know, this is Shelly's brother. This is, um, Ruth's son, you know, this is Phil's son. This is, you know, Lincoln's dad and Benjamin's dad who's gone. You know, this is a key member of their family, a provider um, a, a is gone. And so I just pray their peace and their endurance and that God blesses them um, and covers them. I, 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 I'm grateful, you know, um, that that he will continue to cover them. And that, you know, we will get justice. But again, I end every show asking all 89,000 viewers to pray for the Markels, uh, pray for those boys, pray that that the family is intact. You know, what Phil said was Phil said, I want them to know that they have a family on in us, too. And so um, I think that's the prayer is that the that those boys might know that they have a family in Marquette. I think Phil gave us exactly what he wants us to pray for. And that is that those boys might know they have a family in the Markels. And so 
that's how I end tonight, asking that we honor, feel, and pray that those boys know that they have a family in Marquette. Thank you. Beautifully said. Uh, love having these guys on. I really do. Um, so insightful and really, really eloquent. Uh, Webster, I can't let you go. Ned Smith reminded me, ask about the bovine. What's going on with that bull over your left shoulder? Well, this is my desk, and this is where the bull stops. You come in here and sit across this desk, the bull ends here. <laughs> I love it. Love you, America. We're back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time with the OG YouTubers on this case. And uh, Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern with a look at the digital forensic side of this entire story. Thank you to all of SDS Nation. This is who was in the chat uh, this morning and tonight. The Philippines, Belgium, Kenya, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, UK, Ireland, Brazil, New Jersey, my home state, Senegal, Dubai. So exotic too. Morocco, India, Vietnam. I said India, Gambia, and last but not least, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, home of Dan Markell. Love you, Markell. Is one we should, like Lewis just said, be one big family, root for each other. Till next time, till tomorrow. Love you, America.